Hi YouTube, it's Joshua Mouse and welcome back to my channel. Today's video is actually the finale in my three-part series covering the Mark to True case. If you haven't watched part one or part two in this series, then you can find links to those in the description down below. I strongly advise you to go watch those two parts because otherwise this video isn't going to make much sense. Just quickly before we delve into this video, don't forget to follow me over on Instagram because very soon I will be running a poll for the next community voted case to be covered on my channel. Open up your Instagram app, type in it's Joshua Miles and hit that follow button so that you can take part. I'd just like to point out this video has not been made to cause disrespect or anything like that. It's just been made to spread awareness about this case by compiling information from various different public sources on the internet. Some names in this mini series have been changed to false names in an attempt to protect their identities. I do say when a false name is being used. The theories discussed in this mini series are just that. They are theories. They are not facts. They shouldn't be taken as facts. And again, they're just theories. They do not necessarily represent the views of myself or any of the investigating officers or anybody involved in this case. Again, the theories are not facts. They are just theories. As always, I ask that you remain respectful when discussing this case in the comment section down below. And with all that being said, let's delve right back into this case. We left off with Mark True, Michelle Martin, his wife, Michelle Oliveira, and Michelle Nihau receiving their sentencing for their crimes. Now, since part two was posted, Michelle Oliveira has actually been granted parole and is walking a free man. That, to me, is so beyond disturbing considering the role that he played in this case. And we'll actually talk more about uh, Michelle Oliver being released on parole at the end of this video, along with some other very shocking pieces of recent news surrounding this case. Let's talk about the aftermath of this case. On the 17th of April, 2009, five years after Mark Dutrieu was sentenced, WikiLeaks released a 1,235 page long document. This document is known as the Dutrieu dossier and is dated from 2005. It contains a summary of key dates, persons, communications, and the financial transfers involved in this case. Now, according to wikipedia.org, WikiLeaks is an international non-profit organization that publishes news leaks and classified media provided by anonymous sources. This website is known for leaking private or confidential information, which they believe that the public should be aware of. And don't get me wrong, this website has received a lot of backlash from many people high up in governments across the world for leaking very important documents and potentially putting people at risk who are on secure operations. Um, if you want to research more into that, feel free. The whole history behind WikiLeaks is extremely interesting and what they do is very, very interesting too. A name commonly associated with Wikilinks is Julian Assange. Assange. Assange? Which is a name that I'm sure you've all heard of before. But Julian's case is outside the scope of this video, so let's continue on with the Mark True case. The True dossier was one of those pieces of confidential information that WikiLeaks had gotten their hands on and leaked. Interestingly, a senior prosecutor in Belgium actually tried to block the True dossier from being released to the public and tried to block people inside of Belgium from being able to access the WikiLeaks website. And this senior prosecutor allegedly did this because the senior prosecutor didn't believe that the people that were named in this dossier that weren't public knowledge, people that were investigated but, you know, were cleared, the senior prosecutor didn't want these people to be linked to such a prolific case, so he wanted to block it so that it wouldn't get out. However, this senior prosecutor's attempt at hiding and blocking the documents was unsuccessful. The leaked dossier actually caused such a stir in Belgium that threats to sue WikiLeaks were being thrown about left, right and centre. What this document detailed is 
very, very interesting to this case. WikiLeaks summarized the Dutroux case as such. Dutroux was a figure in the European criminal underworld, and the case had connections to other underworld figures, to police corruption, and from there to Belgium political figures. You only realistically have to put two and two together to figure out why this leaked dossier caused such a ruckus within the Belgium establishment. Of course, that is just going on the theory that there is some kind of criminal network rooted deep within the Belgium establishment. Now, we initially have to question the legitimacy and accuracy of this leaked document. After all, anybody could falsify or fraudulently create a document and leak it and pretend that it is, you know, this vital confidential piece of information with lots of whistleblowing facts and, you know, paragraphs and evidence in it and stuff like that. Anybody could realistically do that. So we first have to have a look and see whether this document um, could be a reliable source. How do we know that what is said inside this document is real and not falsified? Long story short, we don't know 100% for sure. Though looking at WikiLeaks history, they have a very strong track record of putting out very reliable and accurate and truthful leaks. It is believed that the dossier originated from a Luxembourg-based journalist called John Nicholas. However, we can't say for certain, and John Nicholas hasn't claimed that the document came from him because if he did, you know, leaking a confidential document isn't going to go down well with the law enforcement. Also, him admitting to it may expose some kind of connection that he has within law enforcement. The dossier shows large financial transactions taking place across several different European and international countries in a multitude of currencies, including Moroccan Durham and Saudi Rial. The transactional history in this dossier shows large amounts of money being deposited into Michelle Martin's bank account, Mark True's wife. Just as a quick side note, Michelle Martin and Mark True actually got divorced while they were in prison but just for the purpose of this video and for simplification's sake, in an already very complex case, I'm going to refer to Michelle Martin as M Mark Dutroux's wife for the duration of this video. The dossier then shows large amounts of money moving from Michelle Martin's bank accounts into Mark's personal bank accounts. This led a lot of people to conclude that, due to these large financial transactions, Mark Dutroux and Michelle Niehau were not working alone in this trafficking network. To add to the already massive amounts of frustration and police incompetence in this case, these large financial transactions were not investigated by the authorities at all. They didn't think to themselves, hmm, where are these transactions coming from? Where is all this money coming from? Maybe there's something bigger at play here. They just decided to ignore it. They believed that Mark Dutroux was working alone or maybe they didn't want to believe that there was a wider network at play. Now, as I've said before in this case, Mark Dutroux was an unemployed electrician who lived on state benefits. Yet somehow, Mark Dutroux owned upwards of seven houses, with some sources claiming that he owns 10 houses. How can somebody living on state benefits afford to purchase not just one house, not just two, not just seven, but allegedly 10 houses. Now, interestingly, after several of the disappearances associated in this case, according to the New York Times, Mark Dutroux was paid large sums of money into several of his bank accounts. Within just four years since he was released from jail early due to good behavior, somehow, with his only official income being benefits, Mark Dutroux was worth an estimated six million francs, which is about 1.3 million US dollars in today's money. This doesn't take into account the various assets that Mark owns that were not in his name, assets that were actually in his wife's name. This all to me tells a story of somebody being paid by higher up people, perhaps allegedly people high up in the Belgium establishment to do what he did to those girls. Now this is where the case begins to get even more weird and even more suspicious and mysterious. Since Mark Dutroux was arrested in the late 90s, 20 witnesses associated with this case have mysteriously died. 
This case is quickly beginning to sound like some kind of a work of fiction, dreamt up by an intricate writer, but it's not. This is real life. According to The Guardian, 20 potential witnesses have died in mysterious circumstances, fueling suspicions of a cover-up reaching the highest of levels. The Guardian goes on to say that allegedly important evidence in this case has also vanished, although I couldn't find out what this important evidence was that had allegedly vanished, or really any other sources to back that claim up. The first mysterious death in this case was the death of a chief prosecuting attorney, who was overall in charge of the prosecuting investigation into the true case. And this chief prosecutor was a man called Hubert Massa. Now, interestingly, Hubert Robert Massa had actually been the leading investigator on the same case that Judge Connorot, the beloved judge in Belgium, and the public prosecutor Michel Borlet had worked on before the Marta True case, which was the assassination of a politician. According to the investigators, Mr. Massa had been at a meeting with the new Minister of Justice before he returned home, locked himself in his study, before shooting himself. He left no suicide note or no clue as to why he had committed suicide. He was in his early 50s and he had three children and on all accounts he appeared to be very happy and not depressed. But as we all surely know, depression takes many forms and so many people put on a mask to hide it. According to the Office for National Statistics in the UK, male suicide accounts for 75% of suicide deaths in the UK. In addition to this, according to data from the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, in 2017, men died by suicide 3.5 times more often than women. On average, there are 129 suicides per day in the USA, with 47,148 Americans dying by suicide in 2017 alone. In that same year, in 2017, there was an estimated 1.4 million suicide attempts in the United States. Suicide prevention is becoming even more critical than ever. If you or anybody you know has been affected by any of the topics discussed in today's video, there are links to hotlines, charities and organisations in the description box down below. Hobbit Mass's death, besides all these strange red flags, was not investigated. And as a result of his tragic death, it actually caused delays in the Mark to True investigation as they had to bring in a new prosecuting attorney to analyse the De True dossier, which was thousands of pages long. Theorists believe that Hubbard Massa actually uncovered something that the higher up officials didn't want him to know or didn't want getting out, so they got rid of him. Again, that's just a theory. Now, interestingly, the prime suspect in the assassination of Andre Kools, which was the assassination of a politician that I mentioned earlier, was actually found mysteriously dead too. The prime suspect was a former government minister called Van der Beist, and he was found dead after committing suicide at the age of 58, although this time the body was found with a suicide note addressed to his wife. It is easier to believe the ruling of death by suicide in the Andre Kuhl's case simply because Van der Beist was a well-known government minister implicated in a very serious politician's assassinations case. Perhaps he couldn't bear his reputation being tied Tarnished. Regardless, I found the link interesting between Van der Beist, Judge Connorot, Hubert Massa, and Michelle Borley, all people who were involved in a very public and high up case. A lot of people speculate a connection between the assassination of Andre Kuhls and Mark de True. Let's go through a partial list of mysterious deaths surrounding this case as published in the April 2004 edition of The Sprout. The list details 17 out of the 20 mysterious deaths in this case, we're going to go through just a few of them. The first mysterious death in this case was the death of Jean Van Petterham. Jean was actually arrested and imprisoned with Mark de True and his wife Michelle Martin when they were initially arrested in the late 1980s. However, Jean made a full confession to the investigating officers about what Mark de True and Michelle Martin had done to those five girls that they had kidnapped and abused 
and in exchange for this information, John was released early from prison. Jean then mysteriously died in a caravan fire in 1986, shortly after he was released from prison. The cause of this fire is unknown. It could be argued that technology and forensic sciences examining how a fire is started was not advanced in 1986, so it would have been difficult for them to determine that. It could simply have just been a chip pan fire or something to that effect. Or was it something much more sinister? The next mysterious death to occur in this case is the death of Jean-Paul Tominau, who was a well-known figure in the criminal underworld in Belgium. Jean-Paul had actually been involved in the car theft ring that Marc Dutroux and Michel Nihau had allegedly been a part of. Jean-Paul was also the owner of a nightclub, which one of the ex-witnesses will discuss who the ex-witnesses are later on in this case, claim allegedly underage girls were taken to and for lack of a more delicate word, used. Now, interestingly, Jean-Paul's mother had actually started receiving death threats in the lead up to Jean-Paul's death. It is unknown who exactly was sending Jean-Paul's mother these death threats. Surprisingly, inside one of Jean-Paul's nightclubs, a key was actually discovered, and this key belonged to a garage which was owned by one of Marc Dutroux's alleged accomplices, an accomplice that Marc Dutroux actually accused of killing Bernard Weinstein. Inside this garage, investigators found a car and the owner of this car, when they ran the registration plates, was a state prosecutor in Mons, Belgium, who was called De Manet. On the night of the 1st of April, 1995, going into the 2nd of April, Jean-Paul disappeared. He left his nightclub and was never seen again. On the 2nd of April, 1995, a foot was found in the local canal, which was later identified to be that of Jean. The body of Jean-Paul has never been located. Numerous informants to investigators told them that he had actually been shot, perhaps in a local salon that was undergoing renovations, and allegedly the carpet had been cleaned with bleaches. It took several years for investigators to actually carry out DNA testing on the samples of carpets that were taken from the alleged salon and when they did run those DNA tests the results came back to say that positively there were traces of Jean-Paul's blood found on the carpets. However experts later re-examined the DNA evidence and concluded that it was a false positive and no traces of Jean-Paul's DNA was actually found on the carpet. What happened to Jean-Paul is truly a mystery and the fact that he was so closely linked to Marc Dutroux and this case just gives me shivers. He was linked to the car theft ring that Mark Dutroux was a part of, which was allegedly used to smuggle young children in and out of the country. Jean-Paul's nightclub allegedly hosted sex parties involving minors, which were attended by high-ranking members of the Belgian government and policing system, allegedly. Did Jean-Paul know too much? Did somebody order his termination. The third person to mysteriously die in connection to the Mark de True case was a man called Jose Stepp. Now, according to some sources, a few weeks after the Mark de True case went public, Jose contacted a journalist and told this journalist that he had very important information regarding Mark de True. Jose was an asthmatic and on the 15th of July 1995, he was actually found dead. Investigators discovered the drug Rehitnol in his respirator. If we go back to earlier in this mini-series, we know that Mark Dutroux's drug of choice was Rehitnol. It was a drug that he had easy access to and a drug that he used on a lot of his victims. Was this simply a coincidence or is there something more sinister at play? Interestingly, no autopsy was carried out on Jose's remains. Who did this to Jose remains a mystery, and how the rehitnol got into his respirator is a question plaguing his family 
to this day. The fourth person to perish mysteriously in connection to this case was a man called Bruno Tagliaferro, who died just a mere months after Jose. Now, Bruno's death is particularly of interest due to the fact that he was a scrap metal merchant. He had actually been contacted to demolish the car that Julie and Melissa had been allegedly kidnapped and abducted in. And Bruce told the investigators that he actually had information that could be of use in the Mark to True case. On the 5th of November 1995, not long after telling the investigators that he wanted to speak, Bruce was found dead after suffering from a heart attack. He was just 30 years old. Now, Bruno's wife actually campaigned for over a year to have her husband's remains exhumed so that they could be examined again. And fortunately, Bruno's wife was actually successful in her campaign. Bruno's body was exhumed and samples were taken and sent to America. When the results came back from the American labs, they were beyond shocking. The results came back to say that Bruno's body had enough cyanide in it to kill a hundred men. Authorities then told Bruno's wife that cadavers actually generate cyanide during decomposition, which is why it was found in Bruno's body and the authorities told her that they would not be reopening the case. End of. However, I can find one piece of scientifically backed information that supported what the authorities were saying. I couldn't find anything to support this hypothesis that a cadaver through chemical reaction creates cyanide during the decomposition phases that I couldn't find anything to say that that was true. I did find a scientific journal titled Stability of Cyanide in Cadavers and in Postmortem Store Tissue Specimens, which demonstrated that cyanide is actually inherently unstable in cadavers, with the rate of cyanide concentration in the blood of a cadaver decreasing the least over time. However, it was still decreasing. In the scientific journal, it showed how the cyanide concentration in the blood of a rabbit actually decreased by more than half after 15 days from death. This really stands out to me because for the results of Bruno's tissue samples to come back with that much cyanide concentration in them, he must have had so, so much cyanide in his body, it would be unreal and extraordinary amount of cyanide in his body. He must have initially had an extremely high concentration of cyanide when he passed away. Bear in mind that it took over a year for these samples to be sent to the American lab, so the rate of decrease um, in the cyanide concentration, wow, it just blows my mind as to what this suggests. Just that I just quickly say in editing upon like listening back to what I'm saying, it's entirely possible that the samples sent to America were contaminated in some way or the results came back wrong or it was tampered with. And I couldn't actually find any direct proof, first party proof, that the results were as they were described by uh, Bruno's wife. So take from that what you will. The authorities claim that a cadaver generates cyanide during decomposition has no scientific backing as far as I can tell. Why did the authorities say this to Bruno's wife? Why didn't they want to reopen the case? Bruno's wife, following the results of these tests being made public, was actually found dead. She'd been found dead in her bed after being seemingly burnt alive. The cause of the fire is unknown. That to me is beyond eerie and downright scary. I'm not going to go through this entire list of mysterious deaths, otherwise this video would end up being extremely long. All the deaths in this list follow the same pattern, some kind of a connection to the Mark to True case, they have some kind of information, or they worked with him, and then they mysteriously died under strange 
strange circumstances. There is one more mysterious death that I find to be of particular note in this case, and that is the mysterious death of Simon Poncelet or Simone Poncelet. Simon was actually a police inspector investigating Mark Dutroux back in 1996. He was investigating the trafficking of stolen cars in Mons in 1996 when he was shot and killed. Simon's death remains unsolved to this day. Simon was actually the son of a high-ranking judge in Belgium called Judge Poncelet. Some theorists suspect that Simon had begun investigating the trafficking of stolen cars against his father's wishes, with his father warning him of the danger if he continues. Simon then paid the ultimate price. However, that's just a theory and I couldn't find any actual backing to it. All the mysterious deaths, the severe amount of police incompetence, the mysterious circumstances surrounding the trial, it's easy to see how the Belgian public began to believe a conspiracy to the sickest degree that was taking place within the Belgian government. Even the beloved Judge Connerot began to express his concerns. He described his belief that mafia groups had allegedly seized control of the key institutions in Belgium. Judge Connerot discussed the leaked dossier, saying that the file talks of seizure of children, foreign trafficking, and perhaps even of cells. The sum of 150,000 francs was mentioned as the price for girls. I am struck by the richness of these documents. The beloved judge who had freed the two remaining surviving girls that were being held captive by Mark Dutroux was publicly criticizing and making massive claims against the government that he worked for. It just goes to show the level of corruption in this case. Further to this, and even more shockingly, there is one more shady figure connected to this case. Judge Van Espen was a judge on the Mark de True case who, as it turns out, actually had personal ties with Michelle Niehau, the alleged mastermind behind the entire operation. Judge Van Espen had actually represented Michelle Niehau's wife in court prior prior to the Mark to True case, and Judge Van Espen's sister was the godmother to one of Michelle Niehau's children. Apparently, this wasn't enough of a conflict of bias to have the judge removed from this case because he wasn't removed until 1998, two years after the case had started. Judge Connerot, who was beloved by the Belgian public, who accepted a somewhat cheap pen and a plate of spaghetti at a fundraising dinner and who made a point of not speaking to the victims or anyone directly associated with the case present at the dinner was removed on a conflict of bias. But Judge Van Espen, who had literally got connections to Michelle Niehau, who had represented Michelle Niehau's sister and whose stepsister was actually the godmother of one of Michelle Niehau's children, that wasn't a conflict of bias, apparently. It wasn't, you know, a big enough conflict of bias for him to be removed until two years into the investigation. This, when it became public knowledge, caused a massive public outcry. Yet another one in this case. There is so much more corruption in this case that it is actually surreal and insane. There are allegations of corruption on the initial parliamentary inquiry into the case, which claims that the commission's findings had been tainted by political and judicial leaders to avoid implicating more people. According to the Chicago Tribune, the case was so deeply mishandled that it was reported to have inspired a complete crisis of public confidence in the Belgian government. Let's go back and talk about the police officer René Michel, who was the police officer who confiscated Mark Dutroux's videotapes that contained recordings of him building the dungeon and contained recordings of him doing what he did to those girls in the dungeon. But René Michel failed to look at these videotapes because they didn't have a VHS player and, you know, he actually returned most of these videotapes back to Mark de Troop. Further to this, René Michel ignored the sounds of children screamings coming from the basement when they had searched Mark Dutroux's house, and this was when he was with the locksmith. Despite him having prior knowledge that Mark Dutroux had a criminal history of abducting and abusing girls, and that he had knowledge of girls going missing in the surrounding areas. Crazily, René Michel actually received a 
promotion. And he was promoted to the rank of police commissioner in 2009, which many, many theorists believe to have been some kind of a reward in his part of covering up the Mark the True case. However, shortly after his promotion, he actually passed away. It gets even worse. I briefly touched on this earlier in this series, but according to the prosecutor general, who was called Anne Philly, the bodies that were recovered from Mark de True's properties were far too decomposed for any DNA samples to be taken from them. However, the autopsy on these remains tell a completely different story. The autopsy shows that the remains were not too decomposed and that DNA samples were actually taken from the bodies. What happened to these samples and the results of any tests carried out on these samples is unknown. Why would the Prosecutor General lie to the media about the state of decomposition of these remains, especially when there was evidence in the autopsy report on the contrary? I'm getting really worked up about this case. I'm actually getting really angry. Hairs had actually been taken by forensics from Mark Zutru's dungeon in his basement. However, these hairs were never sent for DNA analysis. And what happened to that hair evidence is unknown. The hairs could have shown and proved that more people were involved in this trafficking network than Mark DeTrue and his small gang of accomplices. Such a result would actually support the ex-witnesses accounts, which are known as the X-Files. I'll delve into what those are now. The ex-witness accounts, otherwise known as the X-Files, were a collection of witness accounts from various different women. Each of the women were assigned a number, such as X1 or X2, to protect their identity. All of the ex-witnesses claim to have suffered abuse due to the criminal network that Mark DeTrue and Michelle Niehau were allegedly a part of. The network had abused children in order to blackmail members of the Belgium establishment, a point that I touched on in part two of this series. These ex-witness accounts independently all place either Michelle Niehau or Mark DeTrue at the scene of torture, rape, and even the murder of multiple children, along with placing elite figures there too. I won't delve into any more details because the testimonies within these ex-witness accounts actually makes me sick to my stomach. In total, there are nine ex-witnesses in connection to this case. The most notable, and coincidentally, the first ex-witness, who we'll call X1, actually had their identity leaked to the press. Theorists suggest that X1's identity was revealed to the public and leaked to the press by high-level members of the Belgium establishment in attempt to tarnish her reputation and void any kind of validity her testimony may carry, destroying her credibility. I won't be using X1's real name in this video because I don't want to further perpetrate any kind of potential alleged campaign to tarnish X1's reputation. X1 told investigators in a testimony, it was big business, blackmail. There was a lot of money involved. Sessions were secretly filmed without the client's knowledge. This entertainment was not just sex, it involved sadism, torture, and even murder. X1 would go on to describe how and where these events took place in vivid detail. X1 described who suffered and how they suffered. As I said before, out of respect, I will not be discussing those details. X1 went on to say that they knew Michelle Niehau and they called Michelle Niehau Mitch. X1 described Michelle Niehau as a very cruel man. He abused children in a very sadistic way. X1 claimed to have been sold into prostitution by her grandmother, and X1's testimony actually lines up and correlates with the other independent ex-witness testimonies in this case. The details of these testimonies are chilling and beyond disturbing, and is actually on par with the case that I covered a few months back called the Alaskan Human Hunter. You can infer from the title of that case what I'm in describing. Interestingly, X1 actually had a large amount of detailed knowledge surrounding the unsolved murders of two women in the 1980s, knowledge that she wouldn't have had if she hadn't been involved or been present at the scene of the crime. 
knowledge that wasn't public information, and knowledge that the police didn't even have themselves. That knowledge began to solidify X1's claims. It gets even stranger. X1 was able to describe in vivid detail the scene of a murder that she claimed to have witnessed. The scene was in an underground mushroom farm, and when the son of the former owner of the farm was interviewed, he said, I have never met X1. All I know is that she could not have described the house as well as she did unless she'd been there. It would be impossible to invent it. Further adding to the conspiracy, investigators that took X1's claims seriously were actually removed from the case. After X1's identity was revealed by the press, she was shunned and shamed into silence by the media and by tabloids and newspaper outlets. To conclude this massive and insane case, knowing all this information that I've presented to you, was Mark DeTrue and his accomplices part of a wider criminal underground network, or was he just working alone? The ex-witness testimonies, the mysterious deaths surrounding this case, the large financial transactions in the DeTrue dossier, and all the testimonial evidence lining up leads me to believe that Mark DeTrue and Michelle Nihau we're not working alone. It suggests that perhaps there is some deeper network at play, something international, something that was so horrific and something that was so secretive that it had to be covered up by high level members of governments internationally and that people had to be silenced with death. Whistleblowers were mysteriously dying. Now on the contrary, Mark DeTrue was a master manipulator and he knew how to play the long game. And perhaps along with coordination from Michelle Nihau, they orchestrated and fabricated this entire criminal network to try and lessen the sentencing against them and to try and move the public's blame on them as individuals and more to the government and more to this belief of a wider network, maybe for them to get out of jail sooner or something to that effect. The allegations that Mark Dutroux made against the Belgian government were met with fear and panic within the establishment, which could have caused ultimately the delays that were seen in this case. And unfortunately, underfunding could have caused the police incompetence that we also saw in this case. Underfunded and overworked police officers is a very common contributor to police incompetence competence, unfortunately, and it is very difficult to blame individual police officers when that is the case. The blame in that respect falls more on the people allocating funding. Mark DeTrue continues to this day to insist that he was part of a larger criminal network. Michelle Nihau, who only served just a handful of years for his part in this case, is a free man today and he walks free. He actually tried to sue the prosecution in the Jachu case for 250,000 euros in compensation. However, this was denied in December of 2011. As I said at the start of this video, Michel Lelivre was actually recently released on parole. He was released at the beginning of October of this year, 2019, under the condition that he finds housing within six months and under judicial supervision, so a probational officer officer had to visit him every now and then. Further to this, as part of Michelle Lelivre's conditional release, he was actually banned from quite a number of provinces in Belgium, as well as all the major public transport links. I believe Michelle Lelivre is also banned from traveling internationally, but I couldn't find more than one source that backed up that fact. According to his lawyer, Michelle Lelivre had matured and was ready to reintegrate back into society. You'll be surprised to learn that there is even more to this case than I have covered in this video, such as the, all the mysterious disappearances, even more wilder conspiracy theories and wilder accusations of corruption within the government. It's such a mammoth case that I can't even still wrap my head around, and I've been researching this case for weeks on end now. I implore you to continue to your own further research into this case. As per always, I've left links to the work cited and my sources in the description box down below. Some information and points in today's video has actually been sourced directly from a really, really talented journalist who is called Elizabeth Voz, who is a contributor for the Consortium News website. I must applaud and credit Elizabeth Voss for her articles and research into this case as it has really helped piece everything together for me. Michelle Martin, Mark DeTrue's ex-wife, was 
released from prison just 16 years into her 30-year sentence in 2012. She will be eligible for full release into society in 2022, which means no more judicial supervision and no more parole officers or probation officers visiting her. She can walk free unsupervised. According to her lawyers, she too deserves a chance to be reintegrated into society. And this is despite the fact that she has already served time for kidnapping and abusing five kids before the whole Mark to True case blew up. And then she repeat offended on a much more severe level. Whether Michelle Martin's repeat offenses are simply down to her relationship with Mark to True and their evil relationship is down to speculation. Now, what I'm about to say next is going to shock you and it scares me. Under Belgium law, a life sentence, which is the sentence that was given to Mark to True, is not a hundred years like you'd imagine. It actually means just 30 years. This means that Mark Dutroux could be released completely in the 2030s. Now, when Mark Dutroux was sentenced to life in prison, he was also sentenced, like everyone else, to a further 10 years of judicial supervision. And this is known in French as mess à disposition. Obviously, I butchered the French. And this judicial supervision is in place to allow reintegration back into society you know, supervised by given officials to make sure that he's not going to do anything wrong. And this same 10 year period has applied to everybody in this case and is usually applied to people who are sentenced to life sentences because they only last for 30 years. Just jumping in here again in editing, I thought it was interesting to note that in the UK, a life sentence, um, if you're given one, you're actually in a lot of cases eligible for parole after 20 to 25 years of that sentence being served. Obviously, it does depend on the severity of the crime. And in the US, it's very hard to distinguish precisely because there's a lot of differing uh, definitions of a life sentence between the different states. But typically, eligibility for parole depends on the severity of the crime, as you'd imagine. But I thought that was interesting to note. Mark Dutroux has so far totally served 23 years in prison in this case. He's recently requested an early release under judicial supervision in this case. And he has a hearing in a Brussels criminal court on the 17th of October, 2019. According to his lawyers, Mark Dutroux, through the particular psychological counseling he's been subjected to in prison, has become fully aware that what he did was abominable. He has matured with these sessions and he is now ready to step into the outside world. Under certain conditions, prisoners sentenced to life in prison in Belgium can be released under judicial supervision after just 15 years are served. Mark Dutroux and his lawyers are using all these facts to build a case for an appeal for his early release. And the fact that Michelle Oliveira was released early that just adds to Mark Dutroux's appeal case, releasing a known and convicted sexual predator back into society. Somebody who kidnapped girls, abused them, and sold them. Somebody who we know for a fact repeat offended after the first time was in prison, now the second time, and after he was released the first time, look what he did. Imagine what he can do the second time, despite the psychological counseling. If somebody is sentenced to life in prison, I think for such a heinous and serious crime, it has to be life until death, in my personal opinion. And I don't usually express my opinion, but Mark Dutroux does not deserve to be reintegrated back into society, in my personal opinion, after what he did. I can't even begin to describe the pain that I feel for the victims and the victims' families upon hearing that almost everybody in this case that was prosecuted has been released and walks free. And that the main man himself, Mark Dutroux, may potentially walk free very soon. We'll find out the results of this hearing after the 17th of October and I will be posting and updating you all on my Instagram and on the community tab. I am hoping and praying that his early release is denied. A Black March has actually been organized to take place on the 20th of October 2019, which is the 23rd anniversary of the infamous White March, which took place 
as a result of the Marc de True case, which was attended by over 300,000 Belgium members of public. And this Black March is to protest the potential early release of Marc de True. I'm really, really interested to know what you think about this case and your opinions about this mammoth case. I do ask that when discussing this case, you try to remain respectful in the comments down below. And I'll be replying to all the respectful comments on this finale episode for a few days after the video goes live. I really want to create some kind of discussion. If you find out anything further that you could add to this case from your own personal research, then feel free to leave a comment down below sourcing your information using a credible source and I'll be more than happy to delve deep into that information with you. Thank you all so much for sticking with me through this three-part series despite all the troubles that I've been having with YouTube approving them. The community voted Levi Belfield case will actually be the next case that will be going live and that should be up by the end of this week. I'll be running the next poll for the next community voted case over on my Instagram so be sure to jump over there and follow me over there. Following that I'll be doing two regular case videos and then a massive Halloween case to celebrate Halloween. Just before you go, if you haven't listened to my podcast, Crime Time, then dude, jump over to Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon, wherever you listen to your podcasts, Spotify, search for Crime Time and binge listen to the first five episodes in season one. Each episode is at least 45 to 50 minutes long, sometimes even longer, and we discuss whole cases there, we discuss oddities in the news, and it's a podcast that I have actually worked on in collaboration with Molly Westbrook, Dark Curiosities, and Kirsty Sky. I really, really enjoy the podcast. I'm really, really proud of it, and I'd love to know what you think. We're currently gearing up to film the Halloween special of our podcast, where we'll be discussing more spooky and paranormal cases. Let me know in the comments down below if you have any paranormal experiences or stories that you want to share with us for a chance to be featured on the Halloween special of the Crime Time podcast. You can find a link to the podcast in the description down below. Don't forget to like this video if you found it interesting and leave a comment down below telling me what you think of this case. Hit that subscribe button and press that bell icon so you can be notified every single time that I post a brand new true crime video. And with all that being said, finally ending the Mark to True series, I'll see you in the next case. In the bay, the